Perfect. It's lovely to see everyone here today. Um, it's it, We're off to a great start, great turnout. Um, and I'm so happy to be kicking off these next two days of sessions with um, all of you today. So I have a quick um, a presentation deck to share to get you oriented to the conference and also some updates from ACD. So if everyone's ready to kick this off, I'm gonna start scaring, sharing my screen. So. Give me one moment while I put this in presentation mode. Oops, that was not it. Right, this is what I'm going for. Okay, can everyone see my full screen? Excellent. Well, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to invite you um, and to have you participate in um, our CCDS virtual conference this year. Uh, my name is Sangeeta Ayer. I'm the ACD scientific advisor, and I'm, um, I'm, I'm really excited to be kicking off this um, session for you today. Um, so just a couple do's and don'ts uh, that will be useful throughout the conference. Um, if you are not familiar with the Zoom interface, um, there's a Q&A box as well as a chat box. Uh, please use the chat box to say hi, comment, interact with your fellow attendees. Uh, please use the Q&A box to post questions that the moderators will then direct to speakers through the sessions. Um, throughout the uh, two-day sessions, we will have occasional polls um, and we'll be posting results of the polls during the conference and the break times as well. So please take the opportunity to answer these questions. It helps us get to know each other, gives us a sense of our audience. And we're really hoping that this will be um, um, interactive and meaningful for you as well as us. Um, so um, we are um, getting ready to get started with our um, conference. It's a two, um, two, day, two half days of talks. Um, we had a wonderful turnout in terms of speakers. Um, you will be hearing from 24 speakers throughout this uh, virtual conference. Um, we have a keynote and a plenary session, both of which uh, I think will be very meaningful to our audience members. Um, and as um, um, what I'd like to highlight as we go through the sessions this year is that the theme of our conference is Road to Therapeutics for CCDS. So how far have we come? Um, how far do we have to go? Um, it's particularly momentous this year because um, this year is the 20th anniversary of the discovery of CTD and the 27th anniversary of uh, the, dis the discovery of GAMT, um, two of the CCDS disorders. Um, and I think it's a good, good juncture for uh, all of us community members to look back on the progress we've made um, and what lies ahead, um, ahead of us. Um, I also wanted to share with you some um, takeaways from our last conference. Um, last year was the first time we moved to a virtual format because of the pandemic. Unfortunately, we are in this in the same position again. Um, and we are, we're just a quick teaser. Next year, we hope to do this in person and actually interact with all of you live um, in person in the flesh. Um, but I will say that even considering that uh, we kicked off a virtual conference for the first time last year, we were amazed by the, the turnout, the participation. Here you can see some of the stats of the conference itself. We had over 180 attendees, um, many, many countries represented, and um, a, a really interactive uh, uh, virtual conference where we had participation from our academic industry stakeholders, as well as the parent community members through moderators, as well as through um, questions that um, came from the community. And we hope to replicate the same format um, this year. One of the other things that we did last year um, is to uh, poll our attendees to get a sense of the, are we, are we keeping track of the pulse of our community and what they'd like to hear about? Um, and you can see here the responses from, um, from those polls. Um, and the conference content was rated very highly. Um, uh, the majority of the population found it to be very relevant. Um, and in terms of uh, what 
uh, type of ACV strategy you'd like to see more of. Um, a lot of the respondents requested more on clinical research. Um, and to that end, I'm happy to um, um, uh, happy to let you know that over our two day sessions, we actually have a number of clinical talks. Um, these are from natural history studies, uh, some of them arising from <clears throat> outcome measurements, uh, whether it is on different rare diseases and uh, but outlining plans for our own community members. Um, and so you'll get to see some of this uh, over the next two day um, session sessions. Um, now, before we actually get started with the conference, I want to take a minute to highlight what ACB has been doing last um, uh, for the past year and what kind of advances we've made. So I'll give you a quick research perspective um, for what we've been uh, working on. Um, so um, I um, spoke about this at our uh, last year's uh, conference as well. Um, about our road to clinical success, clinical proof of concept, and why we needed to embark on multiple avenues at the same time. Um, and um, as you are all, all familiar with this process, you know that the road to clinical proof of concept is not easy. Um, it requires uh, multiple pivots, changes in paths, um, and these arise due to multiple reasons. First of all, in order to get to clinical proof of concept, you need to have um, uh, appropriate therapeutic targets that will result in re disease resolution. You not need to know about these targets. You need to have the right assays. Uh, you need expertise uh, in terms of uh, the type of therapeutic modality that you select, whether it's medicinal chemistry, whether it's gene therapy. You need appropriate models to be able to query um, the uh, uh, query the success of a said therapy before you advance it into humans, so, and that comes in the format of preclinical studies. Um, and so you can see that it really is a village-based effort in order to go from understanding a disease to actually uh, to delivering a cure for it. And along with all of these uh, multiple things that you need in your toolkit, you are going to also encounter roadblocks along the way, whether it's roadblocks in terms of funding, whether it's low, low roadblocks in terms of having the right expertise, um, and whether it's roadblocks in terms of biology that we just don't understand. And therefore, um, a research approach uh, to um, actually resolving these disorders needs to be pushed ahead on all of these fronts. Um, you need the risking of all of these multiple components to achieve that clinical proof of concept to actually get to the market. Um, and so um, with that in mind, last year we unveiled the, these four categories that ACD was considering the pillars of its research strategy um, and what will actually help us make good on that promise to bring cures to our community and how can we make that happen. Um, so one of the pillars was identified as, as research. We've, uh, we've been working proactively to identify gaps um, in our research toolkit. We've been driving funding to um, uh, de-risk these, to drive efforts on these. We're bringing in new members, critical stakeholders that, that have expertise in these areas that will help us uh, um, uh, you know, put together that next tool that we need. Um, simultaneously, we had also uh, disclosed that we were working on a registry, um, and our hope was to unveil this registry. Um, um, last year, we had said we wanted to unveil it in 2021, um, and happily, uh, I'll give you a quick teaser, most of you are aware, but we did unveil a registry earlier this year, and you'll hear more about that through the session. The goal of this registry and how it ties into our research goals is um, it actually uh, collects genotypic information, demographic information for our community. It collects things like longitudinal health history, intervention history, relying heavily on participation from the community. And throughout the, uh, the community uh, or throughout the conference, you will hear multiple calls for action because we want you to have your voice heard, your voice represented on these efforts that we are undertaking. It's our cumulative effort that's going to lead, in, lead to the delivery of, um, of a potential therapeutic or a cure for our community. So, re so represent, come out there, take these questions, take the surveys, put your information up there because that's the value that we create when we come together as a community to solve this problem. Um, 
The other um, aspect that we had um, spoken about, um, uh, an ongoing aspect for us, but one that we are we are slowly making a dent in, is understanding core outcomes. So uh, because both um, um, all kinds of CCDS diseases, whether CTD or GAMT uh, or AGAT, have uh, heterogeneous clinical presentation, we have to understand what's a meaningful improvement for patients. Um, from your perspective, from the perspective of caregivers, from the perspective of families, what is it that's important to you in terms of an improvement? If there's a drug, what would you like to see it improve? And to do this, we have to capture these, um, capture information from the community and put that into, um, um, into a format or um, into a deliverable called core outcomes. And core outcome sets, once developed and published, these will be the tools that clinicians will use um, that uh, that corporate stakeholders will use to understand whether their therapeutic can actually resolve, um, bring those meaningful changes um, with their uh, clinical plan. Um, oh, a long-standing, well, the last pillar and a long-standing one for ACD has been building awareness and um, advancing efforts on newborn screening advocacy. Um, and uh, again, we are in the 27th year post-discovery of GAMT and 20th year post-discovery of CTD. While we do have a, a newborn screening um, opportunity for GAMT, um, it's available only in some states. Um, and there isn't one that's available for CTD just yet. This means that the longer it takes to diagnose these kids, the longer um, is the uh, our parents wondering uh, what uh, what's what their child is suffering from, um, the longer it takes to give them the right set of tools or interventions to put them on a path for better outcomes, better success, both from the perspective of the family as well as the individual uh, themselves. Um, and so the only way you can tackle this problem is to raise awareness about CCDS. Um, tell your story, whether it is to your clinician or to your community, raise awareness um, about, the, about the disease. Um, and then participate in our legislative efforts. And um, um, over the two-day two conference, you will hear from, um, um, from several uh, stakeholders. Um, one of the main drivers of this effort on the ACD front is uh, Heidi Wallace, our president. And she'll be giving a talk about how fa far we've come and what, uh, what lies ahead of us. Um, but um, we unveiled these four categories or four pillars last year, and I'm really happy to report that we've made, uh, we've actually made progress on all of these fronts, and I'm going to share a little bit of how we got there um, and what you're going to see today. Um, um, it's only been um, 12 months, 13 months since we had um, this just as a framework, but uh, again, very exciting to see uh, all of the progress we've made, um, and it would not have been possible without the constant connections within this community as well as the, uh, between parents as well as the stakeholders, academic and industry partners that we work with. Okay. So uh, since uh, we announced the ACD fellowship at the 2020 uh, virtual conference, we have since awarded um, three fellowships um, um, to um, Dr. Kunz, Dr. Adserio Celius, as well as Alex Lee. Um, and you'll be hearing from them to the core, through the course of this, um, um, uh, this conference. Um, our, LOs, uh, our ACD fellowship speak, uh, ACD fellowship recipients are going to be talking tomorrow in a session, and you'll be hearing about the advances they've made. Um, we've also awarded um, a Holiday Heroes grant to Dr. Nicola Longo, and this is towards the identification of small molecule inhibitors um, of AGAT towards GAMP therapy. You'll be hearing about this as well. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to report that um, that this is this is this was one of the goals that we had. We ha we have um, we have been we had. Prior to 2020 virtual symposium, we have been working on efforts towards gene therapy. We had identified a gap in small molecule drug discovery. We know that there are industry stakeholders that are working on it, but in the in the vein of um, diversity, in the vein of increasing our um, uh, our shots on goal, we also identified this as a critical aim for um, the ACD and have been trying to in increase our efforts in small molecule drug discovery for CCDS diseases. And this came through as part of that effort. 
Um, I touched upon our gene therapy advancement awards. We've been very fortunate to have really great engagement with our academic community. Um, and uh, we have a consortium together. We've awarded three um, gene therapy awards since, um, since last year. You'll be hearing from all of these speakers um, at the conference. Um, at this time, I'd like to announce that we have our fourth gene therapy advancement award um, uh, open. The details will be available on the website if they aren't already up soon. But um, get in touch with us if you'd like to um, learn more about this. Um, accessible patient samples. This is part of our reagent toolkit. Um, since the last year, we've seen a, an uptick in the patient samples um, that you see in um, in Korea. We have 13 patient samples of CTD, um, uh, fewer samples of GAMT and AGAT. So um, this is my opportunity for a plug. Please submit your punch biopsies to Korea. They will help uh, generate fibroblasts and patient lines out of this. This is a critical tool if you want um, a specific mutations to be studied. And we have seen, um, uh, we've definitely seen the reward associated with having these samples uh, out there because we are now seeing an increase in these samples requested from Korea. Academic researchers are reaching out to be able to do studies on this. So if you haven't done this already, please put your um, samples in Korea. Reach out to us if you want to know how. As part of our capacity building and community engagement, we've, we've made significant progress as well. Um, we are undertaking an effort to improve uh, assay alternatives for creatine detection, um, um, going back to uh, studies on patient fibroblasts, we have collaborations with academic members that are helping us characterize patient mutations in patient fibroblasts, uh, doing the transcript verification, the protein verification associated with specific mutations. And this has been made possible because of access to the CZI network of researchers. Um, as you may recall, we are part of the rare as one um, Chan Zuckerberg initiative, um, and we've been fortunate to have access to a wonderful community of researchers um, from there as well who have um, stepped up um, to become a part of our community and to help us address some of these uh, longstanding questions. Um, I also want to announce that we've been uh, uh, we have another critical stakeholder now as part as part of our table, which is the Resolute Consortium. Um, the Resolute um, is a, a research consortium on solute transporters, uh, and SLC six A eight is one such uh, transporter. Um, and uh, this is an amazing powerhouse to be associated with because, um, well, the, the stats on the slide speak to it, right? You have 13 consortium part partners, over 100 scientists who are all committed to understanding the biology of solute transporters. And you're going to hear tomorrow uh, from Dr. Claire Stepan, who will be talking about some of the work of Resolute and the types of advances that are made possible through this consortium. It is our hope that we can work with Resolute to understand and answer some of those longstanding questions of biology associated with SLC 6A8 as well. Okay, um, patient registry. Uh, one of the pillars that I spoke about, our fully owned patient registry was uh, uh, was debuted in March of this year. Um, we have amazing uh, participation from our clinician community and our patient community through medical advisory board and the family advisory board. Our um, care uh, uh, members are also, this is our um, industry uh, partnership consortium. They are uh, amazingly engaged as well. We've seen valuable input from them in designing some of the survey and materials that we want to roll out onto the registry itself. Um, Sophia uh, Balog, our amazing registry co coordinator, will be talking about updates from this tomorrow, so stay tuned. Um, I spoke a little bit about this already in newborn screening. Uh, we have some really nice updates to share with you on GAMT. These will be shared by Heidi Wallace, as well as Dr. Marzia Pasquale, one of our key um, uh, members who's driving this effort um, uh, of newborn screening. Um, so ACD's role in uh, RUSP as well as potential paths for advocacy will be, uh, will be made um, public tomorrow. And so you, you, uh, I encourage all the community members to pay attention to it and see what you can do um, to move this effort further. Um, now, while we've made amazing progress, there are still some gaps that, that do remain. And here I've outlined some of the questions. I won't go into detail, but it's my hope that, you know, we are at 27 years of GAM, 20 years post-CTD. This is our time. We've got to seize the day, be bold, be audacious, take these questions, 
the, the best people poised to tackle these questions are here today already. And over the next two days, I hope that more connections, more collaborations um, come out of it that will actually help us make a dent and move us closer to our goal of therapeutics for CCDS. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brazant um, to get started with his presentation. Uh, good morning or good evening, everyone, depending where you are on the planet. Uh, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to share with you some of our latest results on our strategy to treat creatine transporter deficiency in our uh, recently described uh, rat model uh, with the creatine transport deficiency. As a short introduction, I will just remind you uh, the, the main functions of creatine, in, in particular in the brain. Of course, creatine is known since a long time as uh, the molecule that allows the regeneration of uh, ATP through the uh, creatine, phosphocreatine, and creatine kinase system. Uh, in the central nervous system, it is also known as one of the main brain osmolites. Uh, and it is uh, suspected that it could be a neuromodulator or uh, even a true uh, neurotransmitter. The creatine transporter deficiency as uh, agat and GAN deficiencies is characterized by this uh, very strong decrease of creatine within the central nervous system that we can observe here by proton MRS, especially for the creatine transporter deficiency the low creatine in the brain of the patient is due to the absence of a functional transporter on the blood-brain barrier and the low proportion of uh, brain cells that co-express agat and gamut. There is no functional transporter on the blood-brain barrier, so no entry possible of creatine from the periphery. So the patients are not treatable uh, by uh, oral creatine as they are for agat and gamut deficiencies. Uh, in some patients, there are the potential uh, guanidinoacetate accumulation due to agate activity and lack of the transporter in gamut expressing cells. Our aim, one of our aim, is to use our recently described uh, uh, knocking rat model, uh, which uh, bears one nucleotide mutation that change a tyrosine residue to a cysteine in one of the transmembrane domain of the, the creatine transporter. This rat is uh, creatine transporter deficient, as you can see here uh, by uh, a proton MRS. So we want to use this rat and try to treat the creatine transporter deficiency within this rat by using AAV adeno-associated virus transduction that would uh, re-express a functional creatine transporter within uh, the brain uh, parenchyma of this rat and that's the blood-brain barrier. And to see whether we can reestablish uh, creatine within the brain of this rat and uh, also uh, analyze the, the disease or the correction of the disease through a behavioral test and other features uh, that can be seen uh, in CTD, like for example, the decrease in weight gain. So I will share now with you some of our results. Uh, and the first uh, set of experiments that I will show is uh, uh, the transduction of uh, AAV viruses with the uh, fluorescent proteins to try to see in which cells of the brain uh, we can uh, transduce uh, our, uh, our gene. Uh, we chose the AAV9 serotype because it is known as uh, efficiently crossing the blood-brain barrier and transducing the brain tissue and shows also the uh, CMV strong ubiquitous promoter. So I will show you experiments with uh, two types of uh, viruses. One single uh, self-complementary uh, 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 with the GFP green fluorescent protein and the single strand uh, 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 viral genome with the red fluorescent m cherry protein by two ways of uh, injection, intravenous and in intracisternally. And uh, the, these experiments uh, last for four months. So we inject rats at 11 days postnatal. Uh, we uh, stop a few rats at five weeks to see whether something happens. And we let the other ones up to four months to see uh, whether uh, we, we have uh, the expression of, uh, of the transgene. So this first uh, slide is uh, the expression of the GFP protein within the brain of an uh, intravenous injected rat five weeks post-injection. And you see in green 
the signal for the expression of this protein in uh, almost all the brain regions in the cortex, hippocampus, cerebellum, etc., and also in uh, axons here uh, in the medulla oblongata. The same is true for intracisternal injection uh, with uh, even a, a stronger expression here in green in the cortex, hippocampus, cerebellum, also in axons here. Five weeks post injection. Four months after the injection, we still have the expression of the, our transgene. You see here in the cortex, in the cerebellum, in the axons. So this is an example of intravenous injection uh, with the GFP expression 16 weeks post injection. With the single, sorry, with the single strand uh, viral genome uh, and the M cherry protein, we could also demonstrate that uh, we were as efficient as with the the self-complementary uh, AAV. Uh, you see here in red, uh, for example, in the in the cerebellum, the purkinje cells uh, after intravenous or uh, intrasystonal injection, uh, 16 weeks post injection. Having shown this, I will turn now to something more interesting. That means uh, the injection of uh, uh, AAV9 that should transduce the functional creatine transporter. So we have uh, uh, designed this vector with the functional uh, sequence for the creatine 